Okay, so now we're going to talk about the cerebellum, and it is the other part of the motor control system along with the basal ganglia. <coughs> the cerebellum, its job is to coordinate movement and postural control by comparing actual motor output with the intended movement and then adjusting the movement as necessary. It's involved in learning timing and rhythm of movements and synchronization of movements and learning to correct motor errors. So when we're little kids and we're learning to walk and learning to do things, you know, our timing's not necessarily good, our rhythm's not good, synchronizing movements, but we learn and we correct those motor errors and um, part of it is our developing cere uh, cerebellum. So um, it's kind of neat. So we get, um, there's a little uh, diagram of the cerebellum from the book. <coughs> So the information regarding intended movements is delivered to the cerebellum from the cerebrum. So the cerebrum tells the cerebellum, hey, this is what we're going to do. The cerebellum says, okay, I'll, I'll manage the details from here. <laughs> so information about the actual movement that happens is provided from the muscle spindles, the Golgi tendon organs, and the cutaneous mechanical receptors, just like we talked about in the somatosensory chapter in chapter 6. So those unconscious relay tracks that go um, from the spine to the cerebellum, those are the ones that are um, subconsciously controlling the movements. So the cerebellum integrates uh, movement and information from the various sources and adjusts the activity of the upper motor neurons. So that's the way it does it. It's, um, so there are three different areas of the cerebellum that um, affect different areas of movement. So um, we say uh, human movements can be categorized into three broad classes and the cerebellum controls all three types of movement. So um, the three broad classes are postural movements, gross limb movements, and fine distal voluntary movements. So um, postural and equilibrium is regulated by the vestibulocerebellum. Doesn't that make sense? It gets input from the vestibular system, goes to the cerebellum. It uses three different senses um, to influence postural control, somatosensation, that's the weight bearing and the relative position of body parts. That's those unconscious relay tracks going to the cerebellum. Vision, providing information about movement and cues for judging whether you're uh, standing on your head or standing on your feet, upright positioning, and vestibular. <coughs> those inner ear receptors provide information about your head position relative to gravity and about head movement. So all that information goes to the cerebellum. The cere cerebellum organizes it and exerts control through the upper motor neurons, okay? Gross limb movement is regulated by the spinocerebellum. Fine distal voluntary movements are regulated by the cerebrocerebellum. So um, as an example for coordinating all three movement types, you're reaching up on a high shelf to get a book. The vestibulocerebellum provides anticipatory contraction of lower limb and back muscles to prevent loss of balance. The upper limb reaching is coordinated by the spinocerebellum, that's a gross limb movement. Finger and thumb coordination to grasp the book is coordinated by the cerebrocerebellum. So um, there's a little video which is optional, you can watch it if you like. Um, so th there's a um, ton of sensory information that goes into the cerebellum um, and the cerebellar output is it controls that normal movement through the upper motor neurons so if you get damage to the cerebellum it doesn't interfere with sensory perception or with muscle strength but it affects your coordination of movement and your postural control so um, I've worked with people before who've had cerebellar strokes and um, they can do a lot of stuff. I mean, they're pretty strong and pretty over. They have terrible coordination and their balance stinks. <laughs> um, so a lot of times you're working on coordination and balance in therapy. So um, it's kind of cool. So just I just want you to know the three broad class of movement, equilibrium, gross movements, and fine or distal voluntary movements.
and which area of the cerebellum coordinates each. Um, I like that nifty little picture that shows the different areas of the cerebellum. Um, we're we're going to talk about the cerebellar disorders. So unilateral lesions of the cerebellum affect the same side of the body because um, the cerebellar information does not cross over, unlike the cerebral information, which does cross over. Okay, so cerebellar signs are ipsilateral um, because they, they stay on the same side. They don't cross the midline. Okay, so um, any lesion of the cerebellum usually results in ataxia. And ataxia, the definition of ataxia is um, jerky and inaccurate movements that are not caused by being stiff. So sort of like the, uh, if you wanted to imagine what a, what a cerebellar gait looks like, um, imagine that you've had 18 shots of tequila and you're staggering down the street. I don't know, 18 shots, that's a lot. Anyway, someone who's drunk often walks like someone who has a lesion of the cerebellum. And that ataxic gait is similar to a drunken gait. It's a wide-based staggering gait. Okay? Um, when we talked about the somatosensory system, we also talked about some ataxia. And there's actually, in the module, there's a video of some ataxic gait. So not all ataxia is caused by cerebellar lesions. You could have ataxia, you could have peripheral somatosensory ataxia as well. Um, and they, you can do some tests um, on proprioception and vibration sense to differentiate between the two. So um, the Romberg test, it compares um, standing balance with eyes open and eyes closed, and you either pass or you fail. So if you, if you pass, you can balance for 30 seconds with your eyes open, and then you can balance for 30 seconds with your eyes closed. If you have to move your arms to maintain balance or open your eyes, or if you fall or require assistance, then you fail. So um, when you close your eyes, that means you're relying completely on proprioception for your balance. You take out the visual part of it, and um, that's what the Romberg test teases out. So people with cerebellar ataxia have trouble standing with their feet together or with their eyes closed. They have normal vibratory sense and proprioception and ankle reflexes. Um, people with sensory ataxia can stand t um, with their feet together and with eyes open for 30 seconds, but their balance is impaired when the eyes are closed. So um, it's the with, with or without vision, it's cerebellar. If they can do it with vision but not without, it's sensory. That's how they tell. Okay, so there's a, there's a comparison chart in Table 11.6 of a motor control disorder. So they have some basal ganglia, some cerebellar, and they compare muscle strength, muscle bulk, involuntary muscle contraction, muscle tone, movement speed, efficiency, and postural control. And so you can kind of see the differences between the two. Um, the main thing I want you to know in terms of pathologies is, um, is something <coughs> hypo or hyperkinetic? with um, basal ganglia, so if, um, Huntington's disease is hyper, um, Parkinson's disease is hypo. Know some of the, um, the uh, etiology and the basic pathology and signs and symptoms of those. Um, know the definition of cerebellar ataxia. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about just a summary of normal motor control. So there are three fundamental types of movement, postural, which is controlled by brainstem mechanisms, ambulatory, controlled by brainstem and spinal regions, and reaching and grasping is controlled by the cerebral cortex. But even though those are th where the control is, is exerted, all regions of the ner nervous system contribute to each type of movement. Okay, so postural control, it's that's how we get our orientation and balance. Um, and 
just the ability to maintain your center of gravity in relation to your base of support. So um, we get central commands to the lower motor neurons and the central output is adjusted by sensory input. Right? That makes sense, right? So um, we orient to the world using somatosensation, vision, and our vestibular sense. Okay, so the somatosensation provides information about weight bearing and the relative position of your body parts. Vision provides information about movement and cues for judging whether you're upright or not. And the vestibular informs you about your head position relative to gravity and about your head movement. Okay, this is a review. We just went over this. And um, so there are some little pictures in the book about, uh, you know, developmental abnormalities of postural control. And you're going to be talking about um, pediatrics and developmental abnormalities in neural rehab, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it in this class. Um, there are some different um, tests they can do for um, posture. We're not really going to talk very much about that as well. There's a little bit about it in the book. Um, all of the regions of the ner nervous systems are required for normal ambulation. So the cerebral cortex provides goal orientation and control of ankle movements. Basal ganglia um, govern the generation of force of the muscles. The cerebellum provides timing, coordination, and error correction. And the sensory information is used by the cerebellum to adapt motor output appropriately. So all of the areas of the um, nervous system are required for normal human walking. So during gait initiation, um, the swing limb pushes downward and then backward against the support surface. That's what propels us back. And so you guys are talking about this in Jamie's class this quarter, the gait. And the center of mass moves forward onto the stance leg and increases the um, magnitude of the subsequent movement. So um, you get that initiation and you're moving against the support surface and you're moving your center of mass forward. So um, the reaching and grasping, vision and somato sensation are important because the, the vision helps you locate the object in space and kind of see how big it is and what its shape is. Um, you get that visual information, it's that feed forward because you know it's, it's big, I'm going to have to change my motor planning to um, accommodate that or it's small. Um, it's going from the visual cortex, you go to your um, parietal cortex to help process that information. You don't really need to know that. Um, grasping, there's a, you know a lot of different inputs that are controlling that. How much, how hard you have to grip. Is it an egg or is it a, um, a, b a dumbbell? You're going to grip those two things differently. The somatosensory information corrects any error in grip force. So someone who's not getting all the appropriate information, they might pick up an egg and crush it because they can't adjust that grip force. So um, there's a lot that goes into all of those basic movements. It's pretty cool stuff, actually. <laughs> so... Um, in the module, I basically just want you to to know the difference between ataxia, um, cerebellar, and sensory ataxia, and how you can tell the difference. There are some videos in there, those short little ones in the um, uh, neuro evaluation series, um, showing ataxic gait and uh, limb ataxia. There are some... Um, symptoms of cerebellar disorders that, um, and we'll talk about more about this in the brainstem chapter, um, dysdiadocokinesia, which is a wonderful word, um, it, it's the inability to rapidly alternate movements, like going from pronation to supination, um, that's one of the things that you can test. Dysmetria is the inability to accurately mute, move an intended distance, and an action tremor is the shaking of a limb during a voluntary movement. So um, we will talk, and dysarthria is uh, poorly articulated speech. Um, we will talk more about those symptoms in the brainstem chapter. So um, you can also get those symptoms with cerebellar disorders 
but they're more often seen with brainstem disorders. So there's this little chart in the summary of motor control page in the module, <coughs> and it's just a flow chart of the motor system. I do not want you to memorize <laughs> it. I just put it in there just as you can just look at it. And that's why I said you can even blur your eyes and shake your head while you're looking at the chart, but just to get an idea of the complexity of the motor system. It's amazing the complexity of what it takes for us to perform even simple motions. Um, all of that input and all of those systems working together just to do the simple stuff that we do every day. Um, it's pretty cool. There's a little graphic about how the somatosensation and vision and vestibular systems provide information to contribute to our posture and orient in the world and how they exert influence on the um, basal ganglia, the brainstem, and the cerebellum, and the spinal cord. So um, it's, you know, just kind of a cool thing. And basically the upshot is all the systems work together to provide the information that we need to do the movements that we do on a daily basis. Okay, so that wraps up Chapter 11, and that also wraps up all the information that's going to be on Exam 2. So um, this week, um, I will be posting a um, exam study guide for Exam 2. Um, we will have a little uh, chat review um, probably on Wednesday night, I'm thinking, and um, I will post an announcement about that. Um, we'll go over the um, exam review. Um, we'll go over the information in chapters um, 6 through 11. And um, so you will have a whole week to um, process that information before you have to take the exam. So hopefully that will be helpful because there's a ton of information, I know. And um, of course you can always post any questions that you have and hopefully I can help you uh, get, get it all straight in your head before we go into the exam.